so we'll look at eyes first. Um, I'm going to try to pace this out because we want to have a look at eyes. Mainly we're going to be looking at eyes, nose and mouth. Not so much ears because um, they're not super crucial. I'll talk a little bit about ears maybe right at the end. Um, but we've roughly kind of covered um, the major structures of the head. So I suppose the, the main sort of thing to think about or be aware of from that previous section is just the the size of um, the cavities, I suppose. The cavities are quite important um, as a basic kind of element of the structure. So the fact that the the high points or the, the highlights of the cheeks and the brow roughly match the, um, the outside of the orbit. So um, it's sort of a way of thinking of like where those highlights come from because I think people are maybe slightly aware of the fact that the cheekbones have highlights or the brow has highlights, but it's good to sort of see where that comes from or why they occur. Um, yeah, so the sort of the size, I suppose, that the eye occupies and to think of the eye as bigger than just what we see. So what we see of the eye, the white of the eye and the, the iris are um, sort of iris and pupil is only like a tiny bit of the eye and, and actually the eye is, there's lots of stuff going on well behind um, what what we see visually. And the um, sort of forms that sit, that appear to us, depend a lot on what's happening underneath, uh, particularly with with any of it actually, but I was going to say particularly with the eye, but I guess it's just as much with the, um, with the nose and the mouth as well. So I'm going to do things slightly differently this time. Um, just going to make a new layer. So I'm just going to put a bit of a kind of transparent layer over the, the painting um, before starting to draw. And I'll make another layer to draw on. So sort of going back to what Rob was asking about, we were sort of, when we were looking at this initially, we were talking a bit about the fact that up here, so these these sections here are where the orbit sits. So the orbit's probably at about these points. Um, in sort of, as faces get older, you tend to get creases will occur that roughly match in line with where the orbit is as well. Um, sort of an interesting thing to note. So it, in a way it gets easier um, the older a face is. So the orbit would sit this far out, um, but obviously that doesn't necessarily help you that much with what's actually happening sort of in the eye itself. So what I would recommend is when we start, and we'll be doing this when we're, um, we're actually drawing the portrait out. So what we were looking at previously is not um, how I would start a portrait when you're actually starting it and you're looking for shapes, but just to get you aware of like what the actual structures are underneath. Um, so usually what we do, and this is what we'll do when we're um, doing portraits in the next session or in the starting portrait drawings, we sort of look for the center line of the eyes is always a useful thing to go for. So roughly if we were to draw a line through the center of the um, both pupils, basically a straight line, um, that's often a starting point. We do actually go for the bottom of the nose. So the base of the nose is often what we go for as another mark. When we draw the mouth, we tend to kind of go for where is the kind of average point that runs through the, the whole mouth. Um, and that there are kind of beyond the fact we'll have already had the bottom of the chin and then the top of the head marked in. Um, those are our kind of major landmarks we look for, surface landmarks. So they're not just about the skull, um, they, they incorporate aspects of the skull. As I say, the, the base of the nose obviously will tend to match um, that little bone that juts out at the bottom of the cavity. But the center of the eyes is nothing specifically to do with um, the, the orbits. But that's often a starting point. We also usually kind of look for what's the kind of center line of the face. So the center of the face sort of runs through those points. It's good to be aware of that because that talking about symmetry and symmetry is very important in the previous section we were looking at how things mirror from side to side. So how the cheekbones would mirror across um, symmetrically. So those are usually my starting points for a portrait drawing would be the outside of the head, then the center line of the eyes, um, either draw it in or be aware of what the center line of the face is, 
bottom of the nose, center of the mouth, bottom of the chin. That's a really useful kind of set of starting points, quite simple to work with. Beyond that, so I'm just going to erase those. Um, the next point, so if I start then going looking at looking into the eyes, I don't like to start with the um, the sort of top lid, but I start with this fold. If this fold exists, we go for that first. So I'll do that on both sides. So you've got this fold, and that's the basically when the the eyelid opens. The eyelid opens and rolls back over the top of the eyeball and it basically the skin folds back underneath the orbit. So that's why being aware of the orbit is important because all of this is bone and then this is flesh that's rolling over what we see of the eyeball. The eyeball sits kind of embedded um, behind the orbit. So when the eyes are closed, all the skin opens up and this top lid would fold down and meet the bottom lid. So it tends to be that the bottom, the top lid kind of closes down onto the bottom lid. The bottom lid doesn't move as much. It doesn't really kind of close upwards. So we'll see a little bit. Oh, actually I can open it just while, we've, while we're talking about this, this other guy with his eyes closed. You can see on him, his, his top lid has dropped down and you can sort of make out that the sculptor has actually drawn in um, the lens. So the lens on the, the eyeball is slightly pronounced of the actual ball. So there's this kind of little bulge and you see it if someone moves their eyes around when their eyes are closed, you see the lens move around and it moves the skin on top. Um, but yeah, you can see here that the his top lid basically is just dropped down to his bottom lid. So if we go back to here, you can imagine if she was to close her eyes, that top lid rolls down and meets the bottom lid about there, probably about that point. Um, and that would be what she looked like with her eyes closed. If she opened her eyes really wide, all of the, the top lid would fold back and disappear into this, this crease here. One other reason why this crease is always really important is you can see in this painting how dark it is. And it's one of the few places in the, um, the face where you tend to get a... Um, what's called an occlusion shadow, so a place where light can't bounce around. If, if you did the basics of form last week, you'll we'll have talked about occlusion shadows. So generally, light is sort of bouncing around and illuminating everything, even in the shadowy parts of um, her face. We've got sort of particularly, say down here, you can see there's a reflected light off her collar that's illuminating the shadow underneath her chin. But in here, this bit. Um, no, it's such a deep crease and you get this very often in eyes, such a deep crease that you get this sort of really dark line and it's this um, place where light doesn't bounce around. So the eyes have a lot of dark, a lot of contrast. Um, the main places where you get contrast in the face are where the, the lid rolls back, that point we're talking about. You tend to get quite a dark um, sort of accent at the bottom of the top lid you get dark accents, occlusion shadows where the nostrils are because again, the nostrils are a place where light eventually can't reach, so it goes very dark. And again, in the mouth, you get these, you can see the corners of her mouth and a few points through the center of her mouth go quite dark as well. And again, they're occlusion shadows because it's a place where two forms are kind of rolling into each other and at some point they get really dark. All the other line, all the other kind of creases or forms and folds within her face aren't as contrasty so it's sort of interesting that the the kind of major features that we look at, and probably it's some something to do with evolution, evolution really makes sense, but that's where we get these kind of points of highest contrast, and points of highest contrast tend to be that where we actually look um, when we're when we're first looking at something, that's what engages the eye. So I like to start looking for this crease here, and that crease is the bottom of the the orbit. So I start there, and that gives me the top of the top lid. Um, you do get um, you get like different types of eyes as well. Like sometimes the top lid isn't visible, um, which is usually a bit easier because you actually just have the the fold back. Um, so this this whole thing with the top lid doesn't exist essentially. Um, so that's a kind of exception to this rule. Um, I think all of the references I've got, we've got a top lid to work with. So we've got. Where this crease is, that's always a useful um, starting point. You also, with the eyes, want to be aware of um, the fact that there's 
we see a little bit of the front of the face before the eye starts and then before the nose begins. So see this little kind of flat plane, this gap here. You want to be aware of that. People often don't leave enough room for that. Um, so be aware of that. Then sort of after that, we have the side plane of the nose on both sides and then the front plane of the nose, basically. So just be aware of that spacing when you're working with eyes. You usually have a little bit of sort of flesh that shows before the actual eye starts and um, before the tear duct. So you can sort of see the tear duct on both sides there. Um, likewise, actually, you tend to see a little bit of a kind of flat plane before the, the, the head angles back um, on the outside as well. Okay, All right. So that's, that's the relevance of the orbit then, isn't it? Um... Yeah, because once you, you can go across to the, the skull, but yeah, the, the eye would sort of sit in this point here, but then the, we've got this sort of flat plane before the angle back at the, mm. the edge of the orbit. But yeah, having, being aware of those, um, those, that sort of spacing, we'll have a look at that, this in all of the eyes actually, we'll, we might not go through all of the examples again so that we can make it through all the features, but um, yeah, that, that little extra spacing is kind of useful to be aware of. So a lot of the eye, I would say, is actually leaving, making sure there's enough room for everything that happens because a lot of stuff happens in the eye space. So the, the space of the eyes is sort of, this is the top of the orbit here. That's the bottom of the orbit. And we have to try to fit all these complex forms into quite a small space, which is what's really tricky. Um, so yeah, being aware of those kind of allowing spaces is quite important. Um, yeah, that's okay, Helen. I just saw your message. Don't worry. Um, if you if you drop out, I'll just try to keep an eye on you and, and let you back in. So we've got the, the spacing um, from the corners of the eye um, on either side. And as I say, that connects to the side planes of the nose, and then we've got the front plane of the nose. And we've already spoken about the sort of outer orbit which we'll, we'll go back into near the end of talking about this eye. But the next thing I look to look for is the bottom of the top lid. Um, and an important thing to note with the bottom of the top lid is it's not, um, even viewed front on, it's not usually kind of like a symmetrical kind of curve. There's usually a high point that's, that angles slightly. So you see the kind of, the highest point of the eye sits in from the center of the eye. Um, it doesn't sit sort of here. So the eye isn't symmetrical. Um, and you see this mirrored on both sides. So I'll just put her eye in on this side. And then that angles back down. So that's our top lid. What I usually put in after the top lid, and um, not everyone does this actually, but I, I find it useful to put your um, eyes, the actual kind of iris in quite early on in the drawing. And then the bottom of the iris tells you where the top of the bottom lid is. Because the top of the bottom lid is generally not a shadow at all. So you kind of want to leave it alone and again, leave enough space. Because you need enough space that there's, there's a sense that there's a thickness to the skin of the eyelids. So the top eyelid, um, if I can turn these bits off, you can see the top eyelid is pronounced. It sits forward of the eyeball. So you've got the flat plane of the top of the lid or the kind of the main bit of the lid that we see, then probably like a millimeter or two millimeters where it angles back in before it reaches the eyeball. So that's why you get this quite dark line underneath the, the lid. And then the opposite happens at the bottom lid when, when lit from above. So the top of the bottom lid, again, a millimeter or two millimeters of light catches, particularly because the, the lids, the top, top of the bottom lid will tend to be wet because of the tears in the eyes. So it'll tend to be slightly shiny and it'll catch a bit of light and then we've got the front plane of the the bottom lid so being aware of that thickness that there is a thickness to the lids is really important and again it's all about leaving space for that because if you compress every if you make things too big too quickly then you don't have enough space for those bits um, but as i say what i find useful is um, if you you find the position and shape of the the irises quite early on so you've got your top lid put the iris in um, for one it sort of helps with um, the sort of where is the where are the eyes looking are they both looking in the same direction and do they both sit in the eye correctly together 
you don't have to flesh them out. I usually just put them in as like two shapes like this, basically. Um, and it also kind of makes you aware, aware of uh, where the <clears throat> the top of the bottom lid is. Very often, the top of the bottom lid cuts off the bottom of the iris as well. Unless, depending on if the eyes are looking upwards, you'll see the bottom of the iris. But usually, you don't see the top or bottom of the, the iris. So that that shape there, if you get the, the flat bottom of where the, the iris is cut off correct, it starts to indicate where the top of the bottom lid will be. And very often, like you can see in in this, the contrast is a lot lower through the bottom lid. So that's why it's not quite as crucial, I find, as the top stuff going on in the top lid, because that's where a lot of the shadows and contrasts occur. Um, yeah, so we've got them, and then the this is sort of the bottom of the orbit, which we maybe wouldn't put in straight away, but it's useful to be aware of as we're talking about the anatomy. And so that's where that bag sits. And then below the bag is the highlight of the um, the cheekbone. So we're talking about the cheekbone. You can sort of see that underneath there. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for sort of the placements of aspects of the eyes. So we would render this out if we were rendering it, but what I've drawn in there basically captures all of those um, points of contrast within the eyes. But as I say, it's use most useful to find that crease first. Be aware of those widths, make sure there's enough space for the widths, either just by eye or you can kind of very lightly sketch them in. Then find the top of the um, bottom of the top lid and then a placement for the eye. We'll find some different examples if sometimes certain lighting will cause a much stronger or certain types of eyelids will cause a much stronger shadow underneath um, the bottom lid and in, in that case you'd sort of probably want to mark in the bottom lid but in this case this particular kind of lighting scenario where she's lit quite strongly from in front you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about that um, yeah I'm gonna leave I'll leave her up and then we'll come back to her when we start looking at the shapes in the nose uh, we won't we've talked about him he's got his eyes closed um, which is not generally closed. Eyes closed is a bit easier to draw than eyes open anyway. So let's find which one to do next. Let's do this guy. It's pretty similar, so we can follow a similar sort of pattern. Computer's slowing down a bit. <clears throat> Just gonna try to find oh, there we go. I minimized everyone. Yeah, I just had a notification from Zoom. I thought maybe it was someone messaging, but maybe not. Um yeah, so I'll go back to Photoshop. So again, we can do the same thing with this guy. We want to find the... this crease here. So again, with him, this crease is nice and, and evident, um, that fold. Um, and we see it on this side as well. He, his eyes sort of in shadow, but definitely where that fold occurs, that's where the eyelid projects forward and then it curves back in underneath um, that crease um, where the, the lid is rolling back into the orbit. So <clears throat> we've got whoop, color. Got this crease in in here and a crease or more like a shadow edge on this right hand side as well. Um, again, thinking about spacing, so we've got in the front here this little section before the nose begins of sort of light skin. You, you often get a highlight there, so you can sort of see just a little bit of a highlight on that right hand side, particularly because everything's in shadow, but also on this, um, this left hand side as well, where the skin basically faces forward, catches the, the light, um, and then everything kind of 
it's sort of the no bridge of the nose then angles forward from that point so if we were kind of mapping it out it's sort of flat there angles up flat angles back and then flat across so hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what it's doing then again um, we've got the left hand edge of the the eye sort of that's where the eyeball then meets the the socket and then this is the back of the socket on that side and you can sort of see it there so where that that light is above that's sort of connected to this form that little gap so um yeah as i say it's really important just to be aware of that because it helps with spacing a lot that you have the space for those those little bits if you don't that's very often where you start to get proportional problems with eyes um so yeah definitely definitely just be aware of that as i say you don't necessarily need to draw them in it helps a bit generally i would say it helps to draw them in because you know that you can kind of like create enough room for all these forms in the eyes but if nothing else just be aware of it when you're drawing so after that then again we can find the shape of the top of the top eyelid and it's always worth spending when you're drawing it it's worth spending quite a bit of time making sure you get this shape correct because it, it's a really important aspect of likeness i think um this shape of the the eyelid and again it's going to be slightly different from this side but it's going to have to feel symmetrical so you want to make sure they sort of match the shapes of those those eyelids so that's where we get the sort of shadow where the eyelid angles back in and again i would then go for the shape and placement of the bottom eyeball And usually shaded in. <clears throat> and we can just make out, so after that, that, that gives us all our most crucial stuff to, in terms of the eyes. But after that, we can pop in sort of the bottom of the bottom eyelid. So that's, we wouldn't probably draw it in unless it was a strong shadow when we're drawing it as a portrait. But it's good to be aware of that. So you can see that's, that's the bottom of the eyelid, so then the orbit sits about here. We've already kind of mapped, looked over this, but this is where the orbit would sit. But again, that, that eyelid is kind of rolling back, meeting the orbit, and then that, the orbit bulges forward and catches that highlight of the, the um, top of the, the cheekbone. So yeah, and here is the, the bottom of the bottom lid. And then above that, it's sort of in shadow, and then I go off this you can sort of see we've again got a highlight at the top of the bottom lid because that's catching light and it gives a sense of the thickness of the the eyelids so that's really crucial there again you can see just roughly where those forms might lie and, and being aware of these if you kind of have these in place it just gives you a lot of guidance when you're then starting to actually draw draw out the eyes um, but they're the, the major landmarks I would look for, and they're kind of invariable um, between eyes. So if you can get them in the right place, everything else just falls into place a lot more easily, um, rather than trying to, I don't know, start with, say start with the eyes, or if you start with the eyes and kind of work out from that center point, you often don't have enough space. So it works a bit better working from a little bit further out, those forms that are outside the eye. Make sure you've got enough space within the head then when you go to add the lids and add the eyeball and that sort of thing, you're kind of, you're reducing down into this, this is your sort of big space for the eye. So the, the outside proportions are maybe that big. And then you're kind of finding stuff within that. So your starting point is to find how big is this shape within the whole head shape to begin with. Sort of within this shape, how much of it is occupied by that eye then you reduce into those rather than trying to find how how big are these tiny forms within a really big form try to find the big form so this is what we'll do when we're doing the portrait drawing but you find the big form then you find within that the medium form so how big is the nose how big are those eyes and this is usually dictated by the actual um shape of the shadows so the shadow pattern will help us with this when we're drawing um but yeah those medium forms before we find any small forms um, but yeah, a, a lot of the problem I think people have with small forms is they don't leave enough room for them. 
and then everything they try to like fit all these tiny bits into a really small space or it's too small a space sometimes people make too big a space and then they have a little bit too much room and things end up looking bigger although that's a less common i have seen people do that but it's a less common sort of tendency most people i think tend to kind of make things too small and then when they keep working everything's a bit too tiny yeah they're really small but then there's so much going on like so many there's about as many forms in the eye as there are in most of the rest of the face but it's this tiny little bit of the face so yeah it's it's very tricky i mean i think with portraiture that's why portraiture in like a group setting is quite tricky yeah. um and really portraiture from life works best if you're actually working by yourself or maybe two people working from one model and you're only kind of a height of a person away from them or something because you can actually see what's going on much more clearly yeah. yeah group um kind of like life drawing type sessions with portraiture is always really tricky i think and actually probably puts people off portraiture a bit because it's so much harder than it should be um, well, well, can't see the, yeah. The bits. yeah, I mean, it works great for like figure drawing because obviously the figure's massive and you don't have to go into those details immediately. But for portraiture, not being able to, to actually, it's like trying to do a still life from like 10 meters away, it's going to be hard to do that. Um, so, yeah, we'll do, do one more, one more eye quite quickly, um, and then we'll move into the nose. We've got about half an hour left or so. Um, let's do in profile actually, that probably makes sense. <clears throat> um, so again in profile we can go for similar landmarks. Um, we can find, so you can see here quite clearly where this, where the crease occurs um, near the top lid. It also makes it quite clear sort of the shape of the, the eyeball in the socket. So what you can see from the side, this curve that occurs through the front of the eye. So the front of the eye is not flat. The front of the eye curves forward a lot, um, which is why, and again, the thickness. So we can see the front of the top lid uh, matches that curve it angles out so that kind of sits out a bit like a obviously the the eyelid top eyelid is meant to protect the eye and particularly the eyelashes so that's why everything sort of sits out forward um, and then there's an angle back before we get to the front of the eyeball so the front of the eyeball sits inside um, that lid so this bit here that's where we get that thickness um, that I was talking about which causes a darker shadow um, in the top lid. So you can see that's the top lid. And again, if, if I was to sketch in the shape of the iris, that gives us our sort of indication of where the bottom lid is. Um, and viewed from the side, I mean, that's not a bad sort of capture of the what's going on with the eye. But you can see this again this little bag which matches the bottom of the orbit there um a little bit of a suggestion of the bottom lid it's sort of with half tones with this one that we would actually find all the forms in that bottom lid um but yeah pretty much that captures um most of the important forms of the eye again and you can sort of see this where the brow is where this angle back in is um that's roughly where the socket is sitting like we looked at before um, yeah, the last thing I suppose is you do get a slight sense of the, that edge, that sort of little bit on the outside, the right hand side of the, the eye that catches some light, but viewed from the side, we're not going to see as much of that as we do when it's viewed from in front, um, for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, pretty much. So when you're working from a, an eye in profile, um, people often struggle. I suppose one of the other things actually going back. To kind of a bigger look at it that people struggle with and i mentioned this before but they often set the the eye too far forwards so they kind of they would put the eye here or something like that right up near the the nose but actually the the eye sits quite deep back 
different i mean he's got quite deep set eyes quite a sort of prominent brow um and you'll get more or less deep eyes depending on the person but definitely make sure sort of the the eye is actually sitting far enough back you can sort of see how far back the eye is sitting from the front of the face there um that there's enough this sort of space i suppose not sort of looking at a different kind of distance but that there's enough space from the front of the nose, the bridge of the nose there, to the front of the eye is really crucial um, with a profile. Um, I think that's mainly what people struggle with with profiles more than anything, um, is getting stuff placed far enough back. So yeah, that's pretty much it for, for profile. Hopefully that's fairly clear through all these eyes. 